Thank you very much, hallelujah. So today I have the pleasure to introduce Phil Rieger. Phil is an economic geologist and geochemist currently working as a postdoctoral researcher at GFC Potsdam, where we recently finished the PhD on the George Fisher Massive Sulfide Deposit. In the past, he, he has worked on projects involving a regional geochemical jo soil survey in southern New Zealand, the formation of bentonite deposits in Germany, and low temperature alteration in or iron oxide apatite deposits of northern Sweden. At this moment, Phil is particularly interested in constraining diagenetic and hydrothermal processes of mineral hosted mineral system hosted in sedimentary bases in order to help understand and explore for these critical mineral deposits. Today, we are traveled to uh, George Fisher and he eats geochemical features. So Phil, the next 30 minutes are yours. Hi everyone, um, and thanks to Philippa and Hallelujah for having me here today. Um, I would also like to thank the whole ODH uh, community and all the hosts for this awesome uh, seminar series that we had over the last year or so. My name is Phil and today I'm going to take you into a deep dive at the George Fisher Massive Sulfide Sink Deposit. Before we before we do that, uh, I'd like to thank a few people. So what, what you'll be seeing today um, are the, some highlights from my PhD thesis um, in which I was supervised by Joe Magnell and Sarah Gleason, and in which I also had the pleasure to work with many other wonderful people. Um, I would also like to thank the geology teams at Mount Isa for their great support during fieldwork and afterwards. So, as I said, and as was nicely um, mentioned by, by, by the crew here, um, zinc is an important metal uh, as, as a protector of metals. Um, and the European Commission has recently, <laughs> sorry, I just got a notification here. Um, the European Commission has recently determined that zinc is a non-critical raw material, which means we have enough zinc uh, to, to meet our demands. And this is good because we're actually needing a lot of zinc. Zinc is everywhere. And most of the zinc we have and we produce goes into galvanizing steel. Now, this means um, that wherever we have our infrastructure, our bridges and our skyscrapers, any building whatsoever, um, there's going to be sink and that sink is going to be locked in there for decades or even longer. So whenever we create new infrastructure, and that's going to be especially critical when we're moving to greener technologies in the future, um, we will need to produce more sink. So we will need to do mining and we will also need to do mineral exploration. For example, an electric car will need about 70% more sink than the conventional cars do at the moment. We'll build, uh, build more of our energy grids and we surely want those to be corrosion resistant of galvanized steel. Um, and actually the World Bank Group has determined that uh, the wind farms on and especially offshore will be huge consumers of zinc in the future. Um, so they estimate if politics move forward with the two degree goal um, that they agree uh, that the politicians agreed on in the Paris Agreement, um, we will need 30 million tons of zinc by 2050 for the wind farms alone. For this reason, we'll surely want to explore for more zinc. Um, but does that mean um, that we need mineral deposit research? And where can we as uh, mineral deposit researchers help? I think this graph here quite nicely shows why it is important to do mineral deposit research. And this is um, because over the last 100 years or so, um, mineral discoveries in the base metal space have trended towards greater depth. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that there are no, no more deposits to be found at surface, and this may just be an effect of our advancing technologies. But as we go to greater depth, um, we will also face higher costs and higher in, in, environmental footprints. So really, those deposits that we develop and that we find um, need to be high value. And high value can mean either high grade or high tonnage, ideally, I guess, both. Um, so to find those very high value deposits, um, ideally at surface, we want to refine our existing mineral, uh, mineral system models 
And we also want to understand what creates a high value deposit. For that, I think we need mineral deposit research. In my case, we're looking for uh, high value sink deposits. And there's probably few places on our planet where we have uh, better chances of um, finding high value sink deposits than in the Carpentaria province of Northern Australia. Um, here we've got two paleoproterozoic to mesoproterozoic sedimentary basins, namely the MacArthur Basin and the Mount Isa in Lyre. What is so special about these two basins is that they are host to several of the world's highest value and largest mineral deposits for zinc and lead, as you see on this cross plot of total tonnages versus total grades of all the known zinc lead deposits. Now, as, as all these deposits are massive sulfide deposits, this means that they are not only um, huge anomalies of base metals, but uh, these deposits are also huge anomalies of reduced sulfur. So we do not only need to think about the accumulation of the base metals, but also about the accumulation of the reduced sulfur. Another point I'd like to make on this slide is that up in the northern Carpentaria province, the rocks are relatively undeformed, whereas in the southern Carpentaria, we are facing a situation with variable degrees of deformation and metamorphism. Now, this complex uh, tectonic history, together with the fine-grained nature of the host rocks of these systems, has led to uh, varying interpretations of how these ore deposits have formed uh, over the time. Um, some end member examples would be um, the classic SEDEX model, SIN sedimentary ex uh, accelerative model, uh, during in, in which a hydrothermal fluid is exhaled into a stratified water column where then the um, ore forms syn sedimentary. So the base metals precipitate when they react with the free H2S in the water column. Other metals, uh, other, other authors have uh, favored models in which the hydrothermal fluid replaces the host rock in, in the uh, subsurface during either diagenetic uh, times or much later during deformation. Now, um, this is already a pretty complex discussion, but to add more to it, um, there's also a discussion focused on whether um, these deposits formed via single stage events, via, uh, if there was a single event that formed those huge deposits, or whether we're looking at multi-stage systems in which, for example, this was overprinted and potentially upgraded by this. Now, when we're exploring for mineral deposits, we're always interested in the alteration footprint. And as you can imagine, the alteration footprint is going to look very different in a syn sedimentary exhalative SEDEX environment, where the hydrothermal fluids can potentially be exhaled for kilometers and kilometers to leave alteration footprints, whereas during diagenesis or later deformation, the um, spatial extent and the type of alteration footprint that we would expect is going to look very different. So with this background, I'd like to take you to the area of Mount Isa. Mount, the town of Mount Isa would be located around here. And what we've got in this, in this area is a very special uh, rock formation. It's called the Urquhart Shell Formation. And um, that Urquhart Shell Formation consists mostly of fine-grained sedimentary rocks, namely mudstones and siltstones, and was deposited in the late Paleoproterozoic. What makes the Urquhart Shell Formation so special is that it is host to three of the world's largest base metal deposits that are hosted in sedimentary rocks, namely the Mount Isa deposit, the Hilton deposit, and the George Fisher deposit, which uh, is going to be the focus of this talk here. My study was designed in a way that we, we were looking at drill cores. We relocked and sampled drill cores from both um, the George Fisher deposit through the main ore bodies at George Fisher. But then also we were lucky to get access to a drill core that intersected unmineralized Urquhart shale formation. Um, and I'll refer to that drill core in, in the following as the shovel flats or the background drill core. Now, why this uh, background unmineralized drill core is important is because it allows us to um, evaluate the background composition and to, to create a baseline basically for the Urquhart shale formation. Now, based on that baseline, we can then evaluate the effects of the hydrothermal system um, that occurred at George Fisher. 
by doing that, we can then maybe um, get some more insight into what caused the accumulation of the base metals, but especially also of the reduced sulfur at George Fisher. And then ultimately, we may be able to uh, evaluate what the alteration footprint at George Fisher is back, uh, based on our background rocks. Now, what I would like to emphasize is that the Urquhart shell formation is a relatively fine-grained sedimentary rock. And this means that whenever we throw our fancy geochemical or mineralogical techniques at those rocks, we need to make sure that we go up and down in scale using different petrographic techniques um, so we can uh, get the most value of our uh, geochemical or mineralogical data, as for example here with our bulk rock um, mineralogical XRD data. Only if we understand what the individual mineral faces look like and how they are distrib distributed in the rocks, we can get the whole value of our data set. Now, with all that background, um, where shall we start in these systems? I think the mineral pyrite is a good starting point. And this is because um, basically in all the Carpentaria sink deposits, pyrite occurs in a, a pre-syn or post um, paragenesis relative to the base metals. Now, the formation of pyrite and the pyrite isotopic signatures or trace element signatures have been used um, to refine many of the models in the Carpentaria. For example, the, uh, in the SEDEX model, fine-grained pyrite, as you see here on this image, please, please note the scale here, um, is suggested to form at the same time as the base metal sulfides, when the hydrothermal fluid that contains all the, all the metals and other elements gets exhaled into the water column, reacts with the free H2S in, a, in the euxinic water column, and then precipitates the base metal sulfides together with the fine-grained pyrites. Now, when, when this happens in a, in a SEDEX system, we will have fine-grained pyrite preserved in between the ore lenses at such a system. And we will also have a, potentially have a laterally extensive fine-grained pyrite halo around the deposit. Now, if this uh, has happened, then we can use this, uh, we can detect and use that fine-grained pyrite halo to vector, uh, vector back to the ore lenses of a SEDEX system. So this means if we understand the formation and especially the formation of fine-grained pyrite at George Fisher, we may be able to learn both about our source of uh, reduced sulfur, but also about the alteration footprint and on, on the timing of the ore formation. So if uh, George Fisher formed via uh, SEDEX processes, then there should be a fine-grained pyrite halo that we could use in future exploration pro uh, projects. So um, to look at pyrite formation, we have to understand um, how reduced sulfur is formed. So pyrite is an iron sulfide mineral. This means we need iron and we need reduced sulfur. There are two main pathways of how we get reduced sulfur, and they basically involve the reduction of sulfate. Um, the two pathways are either microbial sulfate reduction, um, which is a biogenic process, and Another pro uh, process is thermochemical sulfate reduction, which is a abiogenic process that happens at higher temperatures. In a nutshell, what those uh, both uh, pathways have in common is that they both need organic matter and sulfate as the main reactants that then react to bicarbonate and the reduced sulfur. And this hydrogen sulfate, the reduced sulfur, is what we want. Now, what is really cool about these processes is that they have distinct sulfur isotope fractionations that we can then measure uh, using techniques such as uh, secondary ion mass spectrometry. But surely before we want to look at uh, isotopic data, we want to look at some rocks. Now, both at George Fisher and in our background shower flats drill hole, um, fine grain pyrite mostly occurs in uh, finely laminated organic rich peritic siltstones. Um, if we zoom in quite a bit with backscatter electron imaging, we see that the pyrite, um, the fine grained pyrite consists of a spheroidal to subspheroidal core with a euhedral to subhedral overgrowth. And that is true for both the George Fisher deposit between the main ore bodies and our background Urquhart shell from the shell flat drill hole. 
If we then move on to the first ore stage at George Fisher, we see that this is mostly strata bound. And here we've got another generation of pyrite that is mostly in, in a nodular form or in, in, in nodular beds um, that occurs together with mostly sphalerite. And again, if we have a closer look in higher resolution, we see that our fine grain pyrite zero that we saw earlier um, is also preserved in this first ore stage. These are all these little uh, spheroidal objects in here. And what we then see is that the pyrite one from our ore stage, as well as our base metal sulfide, the sphalerite, are overgrown on the pyrite. So this means that pyrite zero had to be there when the first ore stage formed. So pyrite zero, our fine grain pyrite is clearly pre-ore. If we then move on to the second ore stage at George Fisher, which mostly consists of massive sulfide fractures of uh, galena and sphalerite, we see that fine grain pyrite is also preserved in there. Um, what we see either in host rock fragments or within the massive sulfides is that we've got selective replacement of the fine grain pyrite by the base metal sulfides, either by sphalerite or by galena. What we also see in this source stage is that there's another generation of hydrothermal pyrite that's called pyrite 2 here in this much coarser grain than the fine grain pyrite. What we also see is that pyrotite occurs now in this source stage. At George Fisher, there's a third ore stage that volumetrically is relatively minor. And here is where we've also got some uh, minor charcoal pyrite at George Fisher that occurs mostly together with pyrotite and another generation of pyrite. But there's also some sphalerite and galena in this ore stage. Now, when we have a look at the isotopic data, we see that our pyrite zero, our pre or fine grained pyrite, both in the background shovel flats drill hole and in the Urquhart shells at George Fisher has relatively um, more negative sulfur isotope values relative to seawater sulfate at the time. Seawater sulfate is considered the, the ultimate source of sulfate for our reduced sulfur. So uh, such a large fractionation to more negative values is typically uh, what we get from open system microbial sulfate reduction. So we've got no limitation of sulfate in the system. And this is typically a process that occurs during the earliest stages of diagenesis. Um, I have to say here that such values are perfectly normal for the time in the, in the Paleoproterozoic. Now, the um, sulfur isotope values of the pyrite from our three ore stages at George Fisher look a bit more uh, diverse than the fine grained pyrite. Here, what we see in our first ore stage, the strata bands, uh, where we have the strata bound sulfides, um, that the sulfur isotope values of pyrite one, our first generation of hydrothermal pyrite, are more widely distributed. And uh, we think that this is due to thermochemical sulfate reduction. Now, when we go to ore stage two, we see that the, the sulfur isotope values in pyrite are intermediate between our first ore stage and our background pyrites. And together with the replacement textures that I showed you earlier and with the occurrence of pyrotite, we think that here we've got some recycling of reduced sulfur going on. The third ore stage at George Fisher has more positive sulfur isotope values again. And this is likely due to thermochemical sulfate reduction as well. Now, what does that mean? Um, what we've just seen is that fine-grained pyrite, our pyrite zero, formed in a pre ore environment during diagenesis. Um, and this is an important observation because this means that the SEDEX model doesn't work for George Fisher. If fine-grained pyrite formed in the sediments, then the base, metal, base metals had to form later. Um, so George Fisher clearly is an epigenetic deposit. What we've also seen is that we've got multiple ore stages at George Fisher with multiple sources of reduced sulfur. Um, so now we see that uh, we have a better idea of the source of reduced sulfur at George Fisher, um, but this hasn't really helped us in terms of our alteration footprint and future exploration programs. Because if uh, George Fisher didn't form by, by SEDEX processes, this also means that we don't have a SEDEX type fine grained pyrite halo around the system, or at least we know that there's some background pyrite in our rocks. So, Another aspect of these systems that I haven't talked about so far is that um, many authors have described large scale hydrothermal carbonate halos around these systems. So maybe we should have a look at the carbonates. There are many types uh, and, and generations of carbonate in the Urquhart shell formation, both in background and at George Fisher. 
But in general, when we look at the whole rock uh, mineralogical data, what we see is that our background drill core, which is shown here in these blue colors, whereas the George Fisher uh, samples are shown in purple, orange, and red. Um, we see that calcite uh, is more enriched in our background rocks relative to George Fisher. So there's a calcite depletion at George Fisher, whereas dolomite is more enriched in rocks at George Fisher, whereas uh, the, um, the background urquhart shell has lower concentrations of dolomite. So if we look at individual carbonate samples, we can actually see that uh, in such uh, nodular carbonate units, as you see here on this image, the, the observation from our whole rock data set is, is actually confirmed. This mostly consists of calcite. And this calcite has a very homogeneous um, cathodoluminescent signal. Now I did laser ablation analysis to, uh, to get uh, trace element, rare earth element uh, chemistry data for that. And why, why are we interested in the rare earth elements? Well, the rare earth elements behave relatively immobile relative to most other elements, but among uh, different rare earth element subgroups, there are subtle differences in reaction to physical chemical changes of, of the environment. Um, so these elements are very sensitive to, to so, uh, those changes. If we now get our rare earth element uh, data and we normalize it to values such as chondrite, for example, or and then we can also compare it to uh, reference values such as the post in Australian shale standards, um, we can get ideas of, uh, of the environment a particular rock or a mineral has formed in. In terms of our background um, nodular calcite, uh, what we see is that the rare earth element composition of those call sets nicely tracks both the post archean Australian shale standard and the respective whole rock of the sample. Um, this means that we have light rare earth element enriched uh, rare earth element compositions. And those are perfectly normal for the, for the Proteozoic. Now, when we look at nodular carbonates from George Fisher, it looks a bit different. What we see at first is that we've certainly got the sphalerite replacement um, of, the, of the carbonates. And what we also see is that um, there is more dolomite in these nodular carbonates, which also is uh, consistent with the observations we made from Horrock. What we also see is that uh, there is a more heterogeneous cathodoluminescent signal. But what is really, uh, really interesting uh, of those carbonates is that now we've got light rare earth element depleted rare earth element patterns. So those are much flatter than our background carbonate patterns. So is this a consistent feature of the carbonates at George Fisher? Yes, I would say so. So most of the hydrothermal, hydrothermally altered and of the hydrothermal carbonates at George Fisher actually have that light rare earth element depletion relative to both the whole rock from George Fisher and also the whole rock from our shovel flats background drill hole, but also importantly to our background uh, calcite. Um, so what is this telling us? Now, this could mean that our background calcite in, in our pre or environment was more sensitive to the hydrothermal alteration at George Fisher. And during the hydrothermal alteration and ore formation, we had calcite dissolution and dolomitization of the pre or calcite, which is consistent with our whole rope data. And we also had uh, the neoformation of uh, hydrothermal light rare earth element depleted carbonates. Now, what would cause such a light rare earth element depletion? I have to say there are multiple ways of how we can produce this. Um, but what makes most sense to me is that we're looking at fluid rock interaction with saline fluids. Um, over recent years, um, a couple of experimental and numerical modeling studies have suggested that the light rare earth elements due to uh, their charge to radius ratio are more soluble in saline fluids. Um, and this means that whenever we precipitate a, for example, carbonate mineral from a saline fluid, we would expect that the light earth elements stay in solution, uh, which means then that our carbonate is light earth element depleted. And this is actually what we see at George Fisher. So now, okay, we see this uh, light earth element depletion in carbonates, but does that really help us in terms of our alteration footprint that we could use that for exploration? I would say kind of um, light rare earth element depleted carbonates 
may help us to uh, identify prospective carbonate-rich lithologies, or they may help us to identify distal uh, carbonate veins to a hydrothermal uh, system. But um, due to the fine, especially the fine-grained nature of those rocks, it may be difficult to apply in an uh, exploration project. So for our alteration footprint, we will have to dig a bit deeper. And for that, I'd like to recap with you what we've seen so far. We've seen that we've got dolomitization at George Fisher, and we've also seen that we've got thermochemical sulfate reduction coupled to base metal uh, sulfide formation and pyrite formation. Now, when we expand our look into the XRD mineralogical data set, we see that next to calcite, we've also got a depletion of albite and chloride at George Fisher relative to our background uh, rocks from the Urquhart shell. And we also see that we've got a phyllosilicate uh, enrichment at George Fisher, as well as dolomite enrichment. Now, if we imagine a rock with chloride or potentially chloride precursor phases with albite and with calcite as our background Urquhart shell that re then reacts with the hydrothermal fluid, um, we could get a phyllosilicate alteration. Um, which is consistent with our mineralogy, mineralogy that we see here. And from that phyllosilicate alteration, we may liberate sodium, iron, and magnesium. And this uh, iron and magnesium could then react with the reduced sulfur to form pyrite and with the, our calcite to form dolomite. So far, so good. But uh, do we actually see that in the chemistry? I would say yes. Um, and the way I, I'll try to show you this is uh, by using a method called the Griesens method, and in particular by using an, a diagram called the Isocon diagram. In this diagram, um, in a nutshell, we are uh, plotting the concentrations of, uh, of all the elements we have from a rock, um, from a background end member compared to a hydrothermal end member. Now, in our case, we are very lucky that we've got the unmolarized Urquhart shell from, shovel flats, uh, from the Shovel Flats drill hole as our background end member. And we've got the rocks from the George Fisher deposit as our hydrothermal end member. Now, what happens when you apply this isocon uh, diagram method is that the immobile elements during hydrothermal alteration will plot along a line called the isocon line, whereas depleted elements will plot below the isocon line and enriched elements will plot above the uh, isocon line. Now, this is an example for, for one lithology, but actually, if we look at all the lithologies at George Fisher and in our background rocks, we see that at George Fisher, we've got clearly um, depletion of strontium and sodium, whereas we've got in all litho lithologies enrichment of thallium and manganese. These elements are interesting because they are mostly hosted by minerals we already know are involved in the hydrothermal alteration system at George Fisher, namely pyrite and dolomite in terms of enriched uh, minerals and calcite and albite in the depleted elements. Now, if we plot those four, uh, four elements, thallium and manganese uh, in an XY space versus strontium and sodium, we see that our background rocks from the shovel flats drill hole plot at the sodium and strontium rich end member. Whereas our rocks from George Fisher plot more towards a hydrothermal thallium and manganese rich end member. If we then use those um, four elements to form an alteration index, we see that our background rocks can be differentiated from the hydrothermal rocks at George Fisher by orders of magnitude. Now, why is it important to go all this way to um, define an alteration index? I'll try to show you this um, with this graph here. So alteration indices can be very sensitive to the composition and to heterogeneities in our background rocks. Um, what we see here is the SEDEX alteration index that, as, as the name suggests, uh, was developed based on the uh, SEDEX model. Um, and we, I've plotted the, the values for all the samples from Shovel Flats and George Fisher um, versus the concentra respective concentration of pyrite. Now, what we see that is that there's a strong co-variation of the alteration index with the pyrite content of the rock. Um, and this in the SEDEX model is not a problem at all. However, um, we've seen that the George Fisher deposit didn't form via SEDEX processes. Um, and this, is, uh, this means that some of the pyrite has formed in the background. It's not associated with the hydrothermal system. This now means 
that uh, a high pyrac content in unmineralized rocks may give us false positives. And we want to avoid false positives uh, when we explore for these systems. What we see now when we plot the pyrite content of those rocks against our, our new um, uh, George Fisher alteration index that we have based on the, both the mineral, mineralogy and the geochemistry of the rocks at George Fisher and in the background where Calchel is, that there's ba uh, basically no covariation between the pyrite content and the George Fisher index values. So, what I would like to highlight here is that it is really key to understand our protolith before we can talk about any alteration systems. With that, I'd uh, quickly like to summarize what I've shown you today. I think I've shown you that the George Fisher deposit is an epigenetic deposit and formed from a multi-stage system with uh, multiple sources of reduced sulfur. I think you've also seen that the hydrothermal system at George Fisher has led to carbonate, carbonate replacement and the formation of light earth element depleted carbonates, as well as the uh, depletion or enrichment of a couple of minerals and elements. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Phil. It was really, really nice presentation. I'm really happy and I have a lot of ideas now with your presentation for future work. <laughs> So it's good. Okay, so I will start while the people start asking questions in the chat and think a bit. Um, I'm really uh, curious about this Isaacon diagram that you presented. And uh, it's really nice uh, and for me unusual elements that you use here, this troncitalium, manganese and sodium. Uh, did you test with other elements or just, just you try with these four that are more highlighted uh, for the hydrothermal and background samples? Um, so, yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, basically, what, what I've done here is plotting all the elements we had in our lithic geochemical data set. Um, so, as you, as you can imagine, those would be roughly between 40 and 50 uh, different elements from all the rocks in our background um, samples and of the samples from George Fisher. What I then did is um, consider all the different lithology subgroups and then I formed a median concentration of these individual of the individual elements which uh, took under con uh, consideration that some of the elements will be below detection limit. Now so these elements wouldn't affect the median concentration so much. I then calculated half of the, uh, I computed those values, those missing values as um, half of the detection limit values. So they would still give a, a true meaning because um, we'll still have some uh, sodium in there even if it's uh, below detection limit. And then you simply plot the element concentration from your, from your background rock versus the element concentration of your hydrothermal rock. And what you'll see are these different, basically you're, you're plotting a slope for every individual element. Okay. And the greater the slope, the more enriched this element is going to be. Um, what may lead to some confusion is that uh, the elements need to be scaled. So thallium, for example, needs to be yeah. multiplied by 50 in order for all the elements to fit on the same graph. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, thank you. I have a, here another uh, question. I will read it. So, Phil, have you tried using George Fisher index on other deposits in the Isa MacArthur basins? If so, what did you observe? Um, there are two the uh, two deposits, namely the uh, Century deposit and the Mount Isa deposit. Here at the Mount Isa deposit, deposit uh, Matt Painter around 2000 has um, in his uh, thesis published lithogeochemical data. And this is from the Mount Isa deposit that I showed you earlier on the map to the north. Uh, so towards our shovel flats um, uh, location actually. And what we see is that we've got decreasing um, decreasing numbers in our George Fisher alteration index also towards the Mount Isa deposit. Um, and that 
And that is good because uh, both deposits are hosted in, in the same um, host rock in the Urquhart shell formation. Now, when we look at a different deposit a bit further to the north, the century deposit, we also see that from, and this is uh, from Mike Whitbread's uh, data also around the, uh, around 2000, I think. Um, it, what we also see here is that in our background rocks, we've got much lower um, George Fisher index values, whereas in the ore deposit, we are having much higher and uh, much higher values. And those uh, background um, background values from, from the century deposit also overlap with the background values we see at the Urquhart shell. I'm not saying that the alteration is exactly the same, but um, there are some similarities, certainly. Okay, thank you, Phil. Hallelujah. We have another question in the chat. Yeah, uh, but uh, before I go to the question, I just want to thank Phil for the discussion. I think he just gave me some ideas on how I can tackle my uh, work um, for my the work I'm doing now. So thanks for that in terms of alteration, just looking at stuff. So there's a question from Greg. Um, uh, I would like to ask Greg to please unmute. Greg, are you still with us? All right. Okay, I'm so, here. Oh, I'm all right. Here. Okay, so Phil, how late is late in the epigenesis? Um, that is a good question. And as you probably know, uh, there has been quite a bit of discussion over the last 100 years or so, especially uh, concerning the Mount Isa deposit. Um, so to me, um, we've got the earlier stage of mineralization during diagenesis, where we form these uh, strata bound massive sulfides, for example, here. And then later on, when we've got our more massive fractures and also our copper mineralization, that could well be during, during deformation. So, I mean, there are models out there that basically range from um, earlier diagenesis uh, through to more um, advanced diagenesis and also basin inversion. I think basin inversion is a new idea that is uh, uh, kicking around now in the um, in the whole Cup Interior province, um, both for deposits in the MacArthur Basin and also in the Mount Isa Inlier. So that could, that could well be. And then we're looking at a later stage. And I think it's been shown that the, especially the copper at Mount Isa has uh, formed relatively late. So um, I personally have no problem with multiple events and uh, an event or events during diagenesis. And then later events during uh, deformation, because we've, we've basically all uh, got all the, all the important ingredients to form our mineral systems. We've got the, apparently the metal sources, um, we've got the right fluids, we've got the right positioning as uh, there was a, a paper in, in, in Nature, I think uh, last year, um, showing that most of our sediment hosted uh, base metal deposits are hosted along, um, thick uh, uh, in sedimentary basins along thick cratons. So that's also the case for the, um, for the Mount Isa Inla or the Carpentaria province. Um, so we've got the right geodynamic setting. And I think it's just about the trigger events. So if, if you've got the right uh, event tapping the right um, uh, reservoir with your metals and your fluids, then why shouldn't you get multiple events uh, mineralizing? At, at even at one location. And that could be well an, an explanation why we have such high grade, high tonnage, high value deposits in the area. Um, thanks Phil for that. Um, there's a question from Korn and you sort of touched on that, but I would still like to ask Korn to unmute and he can um, um, ask his question or maybe say he was satisfied with the explanation you just gave a few minutes um, ago. Korn? Please yeah. feel free to unmute and then you can ask your question. Uh, thanks, hallelujah. Hi, Phil. Um, thanks for the okay. talk, it's great. The, I was just wondering, I mean, you answered the question in part, but how quantitatively, um, how variable is the Urquhart shale um, in terms of its composition? And, and, and just to say how robust, like do you have an idea of how robust the alteration index is in general? Um, thanks, Kuhn, uh, and hi. Uh, I guess it's it's hard to put a number on how robust the alteration index is going to be. 
Um, however, that's um, in order to get the full uh, composition and heterogeneity of the of the ERCOT shell, we sampled all throughout the whole drill core. So this drill core we, we, I'm showing here about 600 meters or so of the ERCOT shell formation. And we extensively sampled all throughout this to cover the whole variability. And of course, um, there, is, there is going to be some um, vari variability depending on whether you're looking at a, a mudstone or a siltstone or a nodular carbonate unit. Um, and this is a figure from, from one of the papers uh, we published here. Um, if, you, if you plot that in a uh, space of, uh, for example, the carbonate related elements or the um, uh, more silicate uh, related elements, you see that there is some variability, but um, for example, if, uh, if we're looking in the um, in the mineralogical space, that is a perfectly normal and it perfectly overlaps also with other mineralogical studies from the Urquhart shell formation and with uh, other uh, sedimentary units um, of the same time of the Carpentaria province. So we'll always have that uh, heterogeneity. However, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the most enriched and most depleted elements at George Fisher are enriched and depleted in all lithologies. So it's independent whether we're looking at a, a siltstone or a mudstone that may have a slightly different composition um, in the Urquhart shell formation. I hope awesome. that Great. kind of answered your question. Yeah, it did. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Okay, so thank you. Um, more broad questions, actually. So after all uh, your uh, insights on this, um, what do you think are the main uh, challenge uh, for in exploration in this area? Um, so if, I guess... if you have to, to, yeah, to choose something to go deeper and understand and help more in the exploration, what do you suggest? Um, well, I think I can, I can only really comment on the, on the geochemistry bit at George Fisher, because there's, there's going to be people who know much more about the structural content and about the regional geology. However, it seems like we're, we're looking, we're certainly looking for, for some right deep structures. Um, there are many publications out there who, who point that out. Um, and then a major challenge in those rocks is going to be, and I think I, I outlined this in the talk, that the deposits have formed in the subsurface. So the permeabilities will be a limiting factor to the alteration footprint we see. And that might, may be why those deposits are so difficult to find, even though they are so huge in size. Then another challenge we're having is that the deposits are hosted in such fine-grained rocks. So there may not be, um, it may not be easy to see the alteration. You actually don't, don't really see the alteration in those fine-grained rocks, even at George Fisher. A George Fisher rock may look the same, that, that is from in between the ore bodies, may look the same as in our background unmineralized Urquhart shell. So working with these rocks can be really challenging and we, we have to try and integrate different data sets from, from the large-scale geophysical surveys to our um, soil geochemical surveys and um and all that so it's i think it's really not going to be it's really not easy to to find these type of deposits um but it certainly is fun to to think about it and to to work on on these deposits um i guess that wasn't there wasn't a very precise answer but i'm not sure if uh if anyone can can give a very precise answer at least i uh would think that it's very challenging yeah but thank you. Uh, we have here, I think Sarah Gleason want to comment or add something. Sarah, you can thank you. Unmute. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question, Philippa. And I mean, we've done some work now um, up in the MacArthur Basin and here at George Fisher, and we're also working in other base metal deposits in other basins. And I think one of the things we really have to start thinking about is that 
These deposits are not formed in basins, they're formed in sub-basins. And those sub-basins will all have slightly different histories. So in other words, you know, things like the, how, the nature of the detrital components, the nature of how much organic matter there is, um, the amount of carbonate, the amount of siltstones, um, all these things are different in different sub-basins. And I think therefore, you know, really we should expect that the deposits forming in different sub-basins might look slightly different. And so this is really the importance of, I think, having this multi-element lithogeochemical data sets, but also sampling barren holes. Because I don't think it would be a good way to go forward to take one model from one sub-basin and assume that all other sub-basins at that time are going to operate exactly like that. So I think we have a bit of work to do in some of the nuances here, and we need to start thinking about sub-basins a little bit more. Okay, great, thank you, Sarah. So, Alleluia, uh, I think we have another question. Yeah, um, it's fine, I'll take that. We have a, a question from Henry. Um, and uh, the question goes, can defined pyrite have ensured the reducing environment necessary for the following hydrothermal mineralization phase? Um, Phil, did you get that or should I repeat the question? No, I think, uh, so what, what, I, what I understood was that um, whether the fine grain pyrite um, were an important component of the reducing nature of the host rock Right, yeah. I guess that was the question. Um, so I think, uh, sure, why not? Uh, we've got many, many reducing components in the ERCOT shell. So there's, uh, there's organic matter, uh, for example, we've got the TOC values up to, to one, two, uh, three weight percent. And then uh, there's the organic, uh, the, the fine grain pyrite in there. So surely that's gonna be a reactant during uh, hydrothermal alteration. And um, I guess, that it plays a role in the um, precipitation is, is pretty much seen in those uh, replacement textures as well. So surely the fine grain pyrite is part of the reactive host rock. Um, but as uh, Sarah also just outlined, the reactive host rock is going to be composed of many components. Um, pyra fine grain pyrite is one, it's surely one of them, but there are also other um, components such as the organic matter. Thank you very much. Um, just I think a question from my side. Um, you spoke of that we need to understand the uh, protolase before we sort of start looking at uh, alteration and analysis and things like that. What What do you suggest in areas where it's almost the understanding protolase is almost um, well? It's not impossible, but it's hard to do because of the nature of the units being replaced and things like that. What do you suggest we do in such cases? And in your deposit. Uh, you spoke of carbonate uh, and pyrite alteration and um, forgot the other one, but how does your alteration differ proximal and distal to your mineralization? Um, okay, I think, I think this question has multiple levels, but in the end it all comes down to the size of the mineralizing system. Um, the mineralizing system or systems at George Fisher um, are huge. Um, I mean, this is a, a huge deposit, and actually, it is not very easy to find a unmineralized a drill hole. So that that was really a, a unicorn drill hole um, um, that had so little or almost none uh, of the base metal mineralization in the Urquhart shell. So surely, depending on where you are in your subbasin, it may be very difficult to to get your unmineralized. Uh, Rock, but I think we have to we have to try and understand our baseline composition. Um, so if you don't get uh, a an unmineralized rock, you probably want to look at a, a weakly mineralized rock. Just uh, go as far towards that end member as you can. Um, and then in terms of the spatial extent of the footprint, again that is very difficult at George Fisher because we are looking at a highly deformed system uh, that is. Uh, that has seen multiple folding and faulting events. Um, so from, from the data we have, uh, that, is, that is very hard to tell. However, um, um, 
what we see in a drill hole where we've intersected uh, a longer section of the um, hanging wall stratigraphy is that, for example, our alteration index strongly decreases uh, towards our background, median background values for the George Fisher index. We also see that for the individual elements. So sodium is depleted in, uh, in the main, uh, along the main ore bodies in that drill hole, as well as strontium, whereas manganese and thallium are highly enriched. And then both these elements decrease towards the, um, our background value. Um, so yes, the spatial, to show the spatial extent is very difficult, but I guess I touched on that earlier. Um, for, for this study by, by Matt Painter, um, he, was, he was able to, to um, correlate from the Mount Isa deposit towards the north. Um, and here, our George Fisher index values um, are also decreasing um, as we go a few hundred meters or kilometers away. From the from the deposit, um, yep. So if you're if you're looking at a at a deformed deposit where it's difficult to find the 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 protolith and the protolith chemistry, then you may just have to uh, to deal with uh, the least altered you can find. Basically, does that an answer your question? Yes, it does. Thanks. Um, and I would like to just tell everyone that I've put the link to the certificates of attendance in the chat. Please do fill that in now because the link will, uh, won't be active after this talk. So make sure you fill it um, as soon as possible. Philippa, over to you. Thank you. So we have another question, Phil, from Jen Ro Roskowski. I hope I'm saying this well. So um, following a bit the previous question. So do you think that the general composition um, of host lithology uh, and organic uh, content is important, important or critical to your formation? Um, you talk a bit about organic content, yes. but can you go um, a bit deeper? Yes, uh, thanks for the, for the question, Jen. I think that is, uh, that is a very important question. So surely, um, a major control on the mineralizing system are going to be the structures and putting the right um, metal trap at the right position at the right time. Um, now, the Urquhart shell seems to be a very good metal trap, um, as evidenced by the, the base metal deposits um, that we have in there. And then there are multiple components within the uh, Urquhart shell formation that will uh, uh, may have served as as perfect reactants so on the one hand we've got the carbonates um, on the other hand we've got the organic matter to get our sulfate reduction going um, and then we've also got uh, other uh, silicate or um, carbonate minerals that that uh, will react and then with these huge systems um, we will be looking at very complex uh, fluid flow and alteration systems so while we are replacing carbonate in, in one place, we may actually be precipitating carbonate in the other place. So they are both in the uh, pH and uh, temperature, temperature space or in the redox space, there are going to be fluctuations. Um, I truly expect that. Um, so all combined, I think, I think there are all these little parts that is not one single component of the Urquhart shell that makes it a good trap. Um, it's all these parts combined. Because um, what we also need to think about is that we we need some permeability for the fluid flow. Um, I haven't I haven't really touched much on that, but uh, in the subsurface we're going to need some permeability, and that can either be created by the dissolution um, and reprecipitation of mineral faces, or by primary uh, porosity that is being uh, preserved during the diagenetic processes, um, and then exploited by the hydrothermal fluid. During the during the fluid flow events, I hope that goes towards answering the question. Yes, thank you very much, Phil. So we are going now to the end of the session. If anyone has uh, any question, you have just a few minutes. Um, any question from your side? No, Philippa. No questions on this end. 
Okay. So thank you very much, Phil. If you have any final comment, you can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for, for for listening and for tuning in. If you um, realize you have you have questions or you want to reach out, then you can find me on on LinkedIn or just uh, send me send me an email. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been great uh, to be here. And uh, thank you so much to Philippa and Hallelujah for for organizing this.